So uh, I'll begin. Uh, my name is Malcolm Bell, uh, and I'm from the Sierra project team that has uh, brought together the BNZ Amazing Place competitions. Uh, as most of you know, there's two sets of competitions. The playground one, which is just finished, and uh, we're going to have a prize award, uh, a prize giving ceremony for that sometime soon. And there's the one that you're involved in, which is the Amazing Place project competition. This is the second of our of our four seminars. We've got um, two really cracker speakers for you today. On, on my right, so your left as you're facing the screen, is Dr. Jan Kupek. Jan is the G Chief Geotechnical Engineer for um, Sierra and knows all about the land and the quality of it uh, and is going to go through what's been happening both throughout the earthquakes but also uh, what has happened since the earthquakes in terms of stabilising the land and this is very important for your projects because we're going to rebuild uh, in the middle of the town. And that uh, Jan will be followed by Guy Evans on my left, on your right. Guy is an architect with Rowan and Marnie who's going to talk a bit about his experiences with um, some of the principles of design that you need to think about when you're doing your project and he's got some overseas experience uh, that he'll bring to bear on that as well with you. So, without me gabbling on anymore, I'm going to hand over to Jan, who's appropriately dressed um, as, a, as, a, as, a fire, as a firefighter, uh, and uh, he's going to have a talk to you first about the state of the land. Okay, Jan. Hi, guys. First of all, black uniform. I'm usually wearing a business attire, but today is a training day, and I'm part of Urban Search and Rescue, so that's the reason for the black uniform with the white uh, and yellow day glows. So, um, I live in Christchurch. I lived here for the last eight years, so I went, like most of you, through the entire um, earthquake sequence. And probably by now you'd think, what the hell is the accent from? <laughs> all right? So, I've been born in Czech Republic. I grew up in Germany at the day my first degree as a structural engineer. I then went to Scotland and um, did my master's over there and my PhD in geotechnical engineering. I worked in South Africa and about 2005 we came over here because a good place to live. And um, the first thing when I arrived in New Zealand, I had a look, what is the geological setting of New Zealand and Christchurch? And the one thing which struck me about um, New Zealand, it actually is a fairly unique place in the world. The geological setting we have is relatively unique. And I'm just going to explain you from the north to the top using my hands. So I didn't bring any uh, PowerPoint slides because generally death by PowerPoint, all right? So if you look at me and just understand it, it's quite good. So in the North Island, we essentially have the Pacific Plate, represented by my hand, slowly moving across and then hitting the Australian Plate, which is the North Island. And as they hit, the Pacific Plate goes underneath, the subducts, okay? And as the material down, subduction melts, it's lighter, it just comes out. And roughly in the middle of the North Island, on the West Coast, we have all the volcanoes. That's the material which actually is a Pacific Plate dipping underneath the Australian plate. So the mountains in the middle and volcanoes are actually on the west side, all right? Now let's go down to the South Island. So in the North Island we have this situation where the Pacific plate goes underneath the Australian plate and buckles it, okay? But in the South Island, the Australian plate does the reverse. It dips underneath the Pacific plate. So over here, as it subducts, it crushes it and it's a continental plate. So it pushes up where my knuckles are, the uh, alpine fault is there, and it actually pushes up the whole um, main divide. And then the whole thing tilts slightly as the mountains go up, the material goes down, melts, and all the volcanoes in actually the South Island on the East Coast. So if you think about it, East Coast, Volcanoes on the east, uh, co uh, sorry, South Island, East Coast, North Island, West Coast, right? And we have this big magic hinge in the middle where this mechanism changes to that mechanism. It's called our capital, okay? <laughs> <laughs> now, which, is, which is unfortunate where I live. 
That's where I'm from. <laughs> so there you go. So no wonder we actually have earthquakes. But a lot of people think this earthquake happens just where these plates actually slide in. But if you think about it, it's actually over hundreds of kilometers a giant car crash and slow moving collision. So within the plates themselves, there will be intraplate earthquakes. And that's exactly what happened actually in um, September. So we had an earthquake, and the earthquake was more or less predicted by the New Zealand Building Code. So it was unknown that the fault line is over there, but if you actually read the New Zealand Building Code, it actually prepared for us for an event like that, okay? So from Colgate roughly through Darfield and up to Rolleston, we had a fault line rupture. And it's actually quite good that we had the surface rupture, and the surface rupture dissipates a lot of the energy, okay? Now, we also know that following a large earthquake, there will be aftershocks. Now, most of you probably haven't expected it, and there's a lot of research going around it, what people actually expect about aftershocks. But not many after people knew about this one. But for every decrease in magnitude, there's a tenfold increase in aftershocks. Okay? So we expected a couple of sixes, we expected a couple of fives, and we expected several hundred of fours and several thousand of threes, okay? So again, nothing unknown. What we didn't expect that the magnitude sixes will be pretty much underneath our city center. Okay? Now, what happened essentially in February, the same degree it happened actually in June and then the same year in December. We had a magnitude six earthquake. And I'm talking about magnitude, and literally what is magnitude, right? It's just an energy description. So how much energy is being released? And people say, look, I've I can guess a 4 quite good and a 5 and 6, but most people don't realize that from a magnitude 4 to 5, or from 5 to 6, there's 32 times more energy being released. It's not uh, twice or double, it's 32 times more. So if you go from 4 to 6, it's 1000 times more energy being released. And that's not intuitively. but. Um, someone uh, called Mercalli, an Italian, actually looked at it differently and said, look, instead of looking at energy release, which people can't relate to it, what is it then actually in terms of um, damage to it, uh, to buildings, to structure, and infrastructure? And it's actually a scale going up to 10, okay? 10 being pretty much area-wide damage. And there are very, very few recorded earthquakes that had a magnitude 10 in the modified Mercalli scale. Christchurch came in certain areas up to 9, and what could argue in the CBD became very close to a 10 as well, because the majority of the building are being removed, okay? So it's fairly unprecedented what actually happened over here. Now, what were the results? And um, if you actually uh, lived here for the last two and a half years, we obviously know that as the ground shakes, or is being shaken fairly violently, because the water is um, there and it saturates the soil, it cannot compress because the particles themselves are not compressible and water is not compressible. So something is happening. And as the shear stress go into the soil, the soil turns into a liquid. And people say, oh, what actually is it a liquid? If you actually go and go to an estuary with very, very soft mud, where you barely can walk across it, that's about the density of the soil actually at some depth. But a lot of people say, oh, liquefaction. I had a liquefaction in my backyard. Well, you actually you didn't. You had surface ejector. The material that is compressed and under pressure underground, the liquefaction occurs, there will be a crack, or quite often it happens around lamp posts or infrastructure or manhole liners or something like this, and it boils out there. And we have these typical sun volcanoes and mud boils. And very unique in Christchurch, we didn't get just one event. We've got four sometimes in other areas, five, six times, where the ground reliquified material got ejected. Now, the problem with liquefaction is that obviously it's fairly bothersome to have his uh, entire street and subdivision covered with a half a meter of sand, all right? But think about it. The city um, care comes along and the contractors and the student army and they remove the material. So the material came from the depth and everything else settled and now the material that boiled out sits on the top of it, okay? If you remove it, that land has settled. Okay, so 
liquefaction has an um, effect that actually causes settlement and the other thing which is causing the material like an crust on top of it can slide into rivers and then crack the land and fairly substantially and it's called lateral spreading all right now if you're looking at it in terms of settlement if you live on the port hills you will now enjoy a much better view than you had it before the earthquake series. So the port hills around Samana, Redcliffs, Mount Pleasant rose up by about 500 millimeters. So they're higher now, okay? And if you go to roughly where the new Brighton Bridge is, that's the area which has settled down. So it's like a seesaw. One part went up, the other one part went down. And that's a tectonic settlement. Things actually move up and down, okay? But then the liquefaction comes out, it's being removed. And also if you take um, loose soil, when you shake it, it will go in a slightly denser position. You all know this. If you help um, your parents actually bake um, cookies or a cake, you put the flour in a tin, you shake the tin, and it settles slightly. The same thing happens out uh, about on 600 meters of soil column rather than a tin can, okay? Now, there are places in Christchurch that have settled only about that much. There are places in Christchurch that have settled that much. Okay? So if you go into areas like Horseshoe Lake, we have about 1.5 to 2 meters of settlement. There's a land with everything on it and everything in it, like the pipes and so on, settled by 2 meters. So as engineers, we need to account for that when we actually rebuild or actually develop. And from a CR perspective, um, areas that were so significantly damaged that it would take a very long time to repair them, that's where the red zoning came into ground. That was actually a response from the government to an unprecedented event and an area-wide damage. And the Port Hills, very briefly, other effects. The ground doesn't liquefy, but we had rockfall, cliff collapses, we had uh, debris slides coming through. So different issues around there. Now, as engineers, what have we done? Obviously, if you want to design something, you first of all need to understand it. So the next thing is we just got a lot of um, borehole drilling equipment, corn penetration tests. These are all specialist tests that were in New Zealand but weren't widely used. And that material uh, um, gear coming to here and then with the Earthquake Commission, with Sierra, with Crash City Council, private consultants start to drill boreholes and sink probes in the ground to measure the strength of the soil, see what actually is underneath the city. Okay? And that's a program that actually lasted and is still ongoing for more or less the last two and a half years. And the outcome out of this one is actually that we have one of the largest databases for geotechnical information anywhere in the world. So if you look to New York, London, Glasgow, Frankfurt, Hong Kong, or even across the ditch to Australia, no one else has actually such a fantastic database of materials. And engineers do generally cool things. So what we've done, instead of having stuck in stacks of paper on a desk, we put them into a geospatial information system. We call this the Canterbury Geotechnical Database. And all the boreholes are being logged in there and are available now for researchers, consulting engineers and clients to actually see where is the good place to build. And if you're going to decide to build in here, what are the geotechnical properties we need to consider during the design and construction to actually enable um, our building to be built all right, and operated? And it depends very much whether you go for a playground or a residential building or a commercial building or a nuclear power plant. The requirements will be slightly different for each. Okay? Now, what we have discovered about crushed soils, what you probably need to consider if you to say we, we do a design for a building or for an area. And it's the same thing we went through at CERA, CCDU, and with clients working as private consultants. So first of all, we recognize that the soils under Christchurch are highly variable. If you go five, five meters to 15 meters away, and you sink the same probe down, you will get slightly different soil conditions. And if you think about it, if you go right now up the Waimakiriri River, you will see that the um, riverbed is completely undulating and it changes fairly rapidly. There is gravels, there is sand, there's a bit silt. And that's exactly the same soil 
gener being generated by the same processes underneath Christchurch. So we had the fast-moving braided river system by the, like the Vaimakiriri coming through. We have the smaller rivers coming through like the Even and the Heathcote. And they all shaped the environment we actually live on. But then the sea came and it retreated back. We have um, studies where the sea was almost all the way up to the airport and further out. Okay, So the sea retreats and comes back with um, ice ages. So that also forms things. And then if you go to New Brighton at the moment, you will see the sand dunes over there. And the sand dunes extend up at marshlands and even further down. So it's a very active process and the soils in Krashich are very, very young. And that's the reason they are also very, very variable because it was a changing environment. The other thing which contributed to the large damage we had in Christchurch was the high ground water table. If you live anywhere, uh, live anywhere in the east, it's a good chance that the water table is somewhere between half a meter to a meter below the ground level, which is very, very, very shallow. In most places where people live, the water table is much, much deeper. So if you think about when you dig a, dig a well, you literally in Christchurch would need to just dig a shallow hole We you have water over there. Most people, in the world need to deep fairly deep wells to actually gather water. So we are fortunate in one respect, but unfortunate in another respect, because it creates a natural hazard in terms of liquefaction. Now, what we do right now also is we appreciate seismicity much more, because we now understand that there are earthquakes and earthquake fault lines within the Christchurch area, looking at the aftershock pattern that actually happened. So the Christchurch earthquake is also one of the best recorded earthquakes anywhere in the world. Because it happened in an area where we had a university, and the university was engaged in seismic research, so we had a lot of sensors out about. And after the first earthquake, people went out and placed more sensors out there. And that's one of the reasons we have one of the highest recorded uh, ground accelerations on record. Okay, So it's one of the best recorded one, and we understand the seismicity, and the seismicity directly after the earthquake was much higher. Okay, But the seismicity decays with time, and it will take probably two to three decades before we are at the new background level. But the good news is, at the, this time, our seismicity is already below Wellington level. So if you expect a magnitude 6 earthquake, you have a better chance in Wellington than in Christchurch at any time during the week. Okay? That's great. Thanks, Jan. <laughs> no worries. <laughs> we, should, we, should, we should interrupt Jan there. Jan will talk to you until about 4 o'clock and probably longer. Uh, yeah, so there's a, I think from my experience in Wellington, we were all very shocked actually when the Christchurch earthquakes struck because we couldn't understand why it was here and not Wellington. As Jan explained, we're right at the, the edge of where these two plates change the unders and overs bit, and Wellington, everybody says we're going to have an earthquake, and we're very surprised that we haven't. Uh, but your experience has been a very sobering one for uh, us as well. All right, now there'll be, there'll be questions, and there'll be time for questions later, but I'm going to move on. If you do have questions for Jan, or for that matter for Guy, then you can use the, um, the Amazing Place website and go into the, the inquiries mailbox there and we will pass the questions on and these guys will come back to you directly. I think that the GIS data that um, Jan talked about, I was trying to remember, I wasn't here for the seminar last week, but I know that Don Miskell spoke to you last week and I have a feeling someone spoke to you also about the use of the geotechnical data. If it wasn't last week, it would be next week, but uh, there's a guy here who um, works on that. Well, they all work on the data, but it shows you the amazing complexities and the amount of information that we have to feed into the design process for rebuilding bits of the CBD. So, yeah, well, thank you very much for that. We, we're going to move on now because we're, we're going to run out of time otherwise. Guy, who's over here on my left, um, is, as I said, is an architect from Warren and Marnie. He's had some quite good overseas experience. He's got some slides to show you and they're really good. And hopefully they'll stimulate you into some ideas for your, for your design. Okay, Guy, over to you. Well, thanks, Malcolm. Um, I'll just put the images up. Um, okay, so here we are, good old Christchurch. Um, I guess you're all familiar with the um, what Sarah's put together on the blueprint, and, and so I'm going to move on with um, a few case studies of, of how other architects have... have um, looked at opportunities for design and, and maybe a little bit of how, how 
they uh, funded it as well. But the key for you guys is really to dream and dream up what your city is going to be. Um, you know, we always start the design process with who is the client. Um, next is how they're going to pay us. But, um, you know, um, so you look at your client, you look at the people who are going to be using the buildings, and you put together a brief. And that brief can be uh, as simple as we just need a, a new lean to um, for a spare bedroom. Um, or it could be, um, you know, we need a, a new casino. Um, so uh, I'll, I'll move forward. Um, I, I saw on your entry forms um, this idea of um, looking around the rest of the world for inspiration. And, and what caught my eye was that um, you've been asked to have a look at the High Line. Well, the High Line in New York, I used to live in New York and work, and I entered a competition um, to rejuvenate that whole area. Um, and this, this was um, the surface of the uh, High Line. What, what the High Line was, um, was uh, I guess a, a conduit, um, an artery, a, a river that ran through uh, the industrial part of town, uh, part of New York, and enabled people to transport um, it's mostly uh, frozen produce and you know the, um, the ends it goes all the way through uh, an area which um, is still called the meatpacking district even though it's all um, high-end restaurants and uh, uh, it's the place uh, your girlfriend likes to hang out um, fashion stores and what have you but anyway this this just showing um, maybe back in its heyday maybe 1950s um, where the surface of this elevated railway um, was in use. And then it, I guess the area wasn't used um, for its purpose and this very robust structure was just left to rot and the same with the neighbourhood and it was um, when I moved to New York I, I was um, sitting in a cafe across the road looking up at the structure and the people saying, you know, you should get up there, it's really an amazing space to be. Um, but it was totally, um, you know, behind barbed wire and you couldn't get up there. So a few years ago they thought, well, how about we just look at this thing? I mean, you can see it there as, you know, maybe you could compare it to um, the image of the blueprint um, with the Avon River running through a neighbourhood. Um, this is uh, the High Line. It um, connected the port to the, the industrial part. Um, but e either side of this was just wasteland. Um, you've um, got the Statue of Liberty out in the harbour, um, out there. Um, but what could happen to this part? And I guess the way a lot of architects looked at it in that competition was that there was a tremendous opportunity to bring people together a place to congregate and meet people and uh, I guess that idea of a place to go infiltrated and, and what we call gentrified a whole neighbourhood. So all those buildings either side of the High Line um, actually increased in value and, and I think you know, you, you know, one of your questions for you guys is how, how do you fund um, your project and, and this, this was unique, I mean now all the the, um, a lot of the most famous architects in the world are designing apartment buildings, um, other offices in and around the High Line. So it's, it's done amazing things for whoever owned the land underneath. Um, so this, this is how it is today, looking down on it. And I guess the way um, the winning architects, Diller and Scafidio, um, looked at this was it was this tremendous. Um, I guess idea of, of leaving the railroad tracks, a little bit of the history of the High Line, um, and along with all the wildflowers that were um, had just grown naturally up there. So, and yet create a paving um, that allowed um, the plants to come up through it. And then a time. Oh, it's also about the time of day. You know, day and night looking at um, whatever that area that you're looking at 
how it could be used for 24 hours, um, enliven the city. Um, this area was um, quite undesirable um, before they did this, and um, now it's the, the place to go. You guys have already heard about it. That's a, that's a pretty cool cantilevered seat. Yeah, and, 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 and I think, you know, um, a lot of people have used that detail um, mm -hmm. and their landscaping around other parts. I mean, yeah. I've, I think I've seen it in Wellington. Um, some other architects ripped it off. It's good for skateboarding. And, and great for skateboarding. Yeah. Uh, you know, a lot of people uh, um, yeah, don't like skateboarders. Um, why not provide for them? You know, they're human beings, most of them. Um, so here's, here's another little snap through there. Uh, and then underneath the High Line, you can see how it was elevated off the street so cars can go underneath. Um, and then, you know, it enabled people to um, think a good business plan was to build a hotel. So over on the left hand corner there is a hotel that um, straddles the High Line and has a wonderful bar in there as so, well. So another city um, across the Atlantic um, that relates to a river running through it is Paris. And they've been doing it for a long time over there. And it's how, you know, I think as designers, you know, we look at um, what Christchurch has important, and that is that the river that runs through it. So, you know, looking at um, precedent, looking at other people's work to see how they engage what is the strength of the city. Now, another part of um, Paris is uh, a very famous art gallery called the Louvre. And they looked at an opportunity. There was a courtyard in the middle of it um, that was really quite dead space, uh, a place that people just parked their cars, and it was really quite uh, uninviting. So uh, an architect, uh, Ian Pei, looked at that courtyard and said, well, how can we connect? You know, how can we um, look at the circulation through the buildings of the Louvre and um, make that better? And how do you pay for it? And you know how they did it, they dug underground, created a pyramid on top of the entry, and there's basically a shopping mall underneath that courtyard. But you can see how people like to congregate under there. And um, you know, the glass, the very modern structure, um, provides a contrast with the original old buildings. And you know, um, the water creates a little bit of reflection and a great place to be night or day. So the Louvre is moving forward today um, with new plans in a place called Abu Dhabi. And this is a, a, a wonderful shot of a new building uh, proposed by Jean Nouvel, a French architect. And uh, I think why I wanted to show you this was we um, and Warren and May love this image because it kind of reminds you of walking through the forest and that light you know, being the most important thing to your buildings. It gives form, um, but that tranquil light that comes through the surface of the roof, and uh, you can see the water also from uh, coming in to the building. So, a um, little, I guess, back across to uh, London, um, I wanted to show you Lord's Cricket Ground, and you know, one of the projects that um, is part of the blueprint is a new stadium, and I'm not really talking about how you design your stadium here, it's really the idea of tradition, the tradition of, you know, the home of sport, well, the home of cricket, um, between a, the traditional old members stand, which, um, you know, you can look at the old heritage buildings here in Christchurch and go, well, how do you um, design something to sit next to our heritage? And, you know, you think of uh, the members that, um, oh, I think the members at Lords are um, very progressive because what they looked at was a new media centre at the other end. Um, if you go back to there, you can see to the left is the, the members stand through the cricket wicket to the other end is this very futuristic building and the Beige Brigade, yeah. who look backwards. Yeah, but yeah. Uh, so, and then back across the Atlantic, back to New York. Um, the idea here is not necessarily about the park, but the space around the park. 
and you know you can see this dramatic um, uh, framing of the park by apartment blocks and, and I think um, how uh, it's an interesting story of how they originated in that originally along the park were just mansions for the rich and famous and what they developers went along to them and said look you know we'll give you the penthouse apartment which is another 13 floors up but you, you know you allow us to build 12 floors below you and um, you know so these people had a far better view out over the park and the developer was able to sell all, all the apartments and, and um, make everyone some money so um, I think you know it's a, I, I've always been taken by Central Park as being uh, just an incredible place to be and it's really about when, when you get inside there and this you know you could be in Hagley Park here um, it's really a place to congregate for the people and how you just um, cater for that you know um, so another way of designing a building and uh, having people come this was in Bilbao in Spain um, and architect Frank Gehry designed uh, actually it's another um, it's a Guggenheim Museum yeah. and uh, by creating a, an amazing uh, jumble of um, forms uh, which is his style of architecture uh, built out of titanium and, and stone it's actually transformed an industrial town into one of the most um, tourist you know, the biggest tourist attractions over there um, and really added to the economy of the town so you m I, I might be um, I guess angling towards you know architecture saving Christchurch here <laughs> um, Singapore also looked at um, you know building something special and and making it uh, a destination um, yeah, yeah. So, you know, there are direct flights, you can get up there and you can go to the casino and hang out uh, at the top, looks like a big surfboard on top of those hotels, mm -hmm. but they were able to finance it through um, a wonderful deal with a casino owner, I believe. Um, Sounds like the current government. Oh, I shouldn't say <laughs> It's been done before. Yeah. Um, and then, I guess, you know, where else do we gain our inspiration? Um, you know, uh, there are a lot of architects who, who love but could never afford um, cars like this. Um, and, you know, potentially go, well, it's, what, the, what is that? And it's uh, a Lamborghini. Now, I just saw this yesterday. I think it's just been released for the 50th anniversary. But mm -hmm. it's, um, you just look at the lines and, you, and, and just how it looks like the future. That's something completely, you know, these guys were dreaming, but it actually works. It functions. It you know um, leaves liquefaction behind. <laughs> so here's a building that you may think that you know it, it, this is a functional building, and it sits um, by a river, um, and you can see the little people walking over a walkway over the road there. But it just shows you that you know with a bit of dreaming, and you, you can get there. So here we are back in Christchurch, and I thought, well, let's have a look at the square and see what you could actually, how would you start looking at a project here? And I think, you know, we talked about the river, and the square is the other most important, you know, public space in Christchurch. So I think you start with squares and you look at, you know, in Italy, um, for thousands, Years they've um, used the piazza as a place to congregate the t the city square that um, where um, all the action is and this is a wonderful town of Siena and that's the view from the top of uh, the cathedral um, you look at just the pattern the texture of, of the paving in there but around the perimeter you can see it's enlivened by a lot of cafes and and places of interest um, to make you want to go there at different times of the day. I mean, the square, I, I, being a tourist myself years ago before I moved here, was, you know, quite dead at, at night. So it's looking at how you could enliven that and make it a place where tourists would take away a memory. And the, the thing with Siena, it also, um, at a time 
uh, an annual event happens with a horse race, and you know, it, it reminded me of um, Christchurch with Cup Week, and uh, potentially um, doing having an event in the middle of the square um, where you have a horse race, and this is a, a historic rivalry between different families um, that own the town, and uh, you can probably see um, some of those families here. Uh, racing around in their colours. And you may say, well, you don't see it here. Well, here they are, you know. And um, maybe at the start of a rugby season, you know, you could have these guys running around and, uh, you know, um, and uh, celebrate what we have. And uh, you know, maybe on Cup Week. Or another way of looking at it, you could just do um, what other cities do and have an Apple store in the middle of town and and that's the place where everyone congregates. But, um, you know, we don't have one in New Zealand, and maybe, you know, it is the new religion. <laughs> All right, well, that's it for me. I'm not too sure how much Guy's commission is from Apple, but that's a pretty good uh, <laughs> advertisement for, for, for Apple. But, yeah, that's, uh, that's really fascinating. So I hope that you've come out of that with a, a few ideas uh, of what you can do. I don't know quite what projects you guys are, uh, are doing. Um, but um, again, if you've got any, does anyone have any questions from Hagley at the moment? I want to well, we out time. If, Sorry, in, I, I wanted to ask Jan if there was, um, well, just what's the best way to check a site? If students have chosen a site that they think is really uh, suitable for a project, how do they check if it's a, if it's good land to build on? Yeah, so. We have the Canterbury Geotechnical Database I mentioned, and in there um, all the geotechnical information is actually uh, contained. There are two little problems with um, getting information that is useful to you. First of all, the Canterbury Geotechnical Database is just for uh, accessing professionals, but I can make the data available if um, you can get it, say, via Malcolm to me. Yeah, is it, isn't the GIS database available though publicly? No, it's not. It's not. Well, it's not. Okay. But I can make the information available. Yeah. But the second key thing is that the information is available generally in a geotechnical pure format. So you can see the CPT test, which looked like a caterpillar was drunk and was falling over, over your piece of paper, which doesn't give you much information unless you really know what you're looking for. But there's always a couple of boreholes, and the boreholes give you information actually down to depth. And it gives you at least a quantity of information whether you're dealing with silt, peat, sand, or gravel. Okay? If you have sand, the sand is loose and it's full of water, probably likely to liquefy. If the river is nearby within 100 meters, it can likely spread into it. So you can very basic tools you can use to actually determine what the site actually is going to be and what it can be done. But don't let yourself drive too much about whether the site does liquefy or doesn't liquefy. There are plenty of engineering solutions for foundations that can actually deal or compensate for any liquefaction, sand balls or lateral spreading. If you look at the moment at the residential guidelines, for building in TC2 and TC3. We do it on a day-to-day -day basis to build buildings in areas that do liquefy and that do largely spread. So you just need to design around your problem. Don't be hindered by the problem, design around it. Okay, cool. Okay, that's uh, awesome. Is there anywhere that, so that you think that, and also my question is, is there anywhere that you just can't build apart from close to the riverbanks? Is there anywhere that you can't build within that, say within the four avenues? There is no place within the four avenues you couldn't build a structure if you're determined enough. But as Guy said, it comes always down to budget. Okay? Sometimes if you compare two or three different sides, you actually need to do the cost, risk, benefit analysis. That's something you can do as well. You can most of you know which sides actually got damaged, which one aren't got damaged. And you just need to look at the building stock around you. If you find a site and most of the buildings are relatively undamaged around it, there's a good indication that the site could be quite fine. If you actually are in the middle of a wasteland where everything has fallen down, it's probably a good indication that the site might have geotechnical issues. Okay? So, very simple, quick 
reality check can help you. But there's no side that you couldn't rebuild. In Crash It, we're actually quite lucky because we have uh, something called the Rickett and Gravel layer. It's called Rickett and Gravel layer because it pops out in about Rickett and Bush. Okay, and it's in Christchurch between 15 and 25 meters deep, and it's a very, very dense, competent gravel. And you can build on this one, you can found on it. But the alternative is you actually build a foundation and float it like a boat. Okay, so if you dig a hole and take 100 tons of material out, and the building in a basement only weighs 60 tons, it will never sink because you took more material out than you put back in. Okay. So, clever design solutions can help you to overcome the challenges. Um, I don't quite know how that works. That sounds interesting. A floating foundation. Bathtub. Mm. Mm. A basement like yep. a bathtub. Like a bathtub. Okay. Mm. Okay. I suppose a bit like an ocean liner. That's it. All right. Look, um, I will find out from Jan um, how we get access uh, for you guys to that geotechnical data. And uh, if you obviously haven't been told how to use it yet so i'm pretty sure that's up and running that must be next week's seminar there's a chap coming to talk to you about how to get how to do that so we'll get that um, up and running and we'll let you all know um, by an email to the main contacts we have for your schools uh, we'll let you know how to access that and uh, a little bit of guidance on on how to use it that's my job of the afternoon any more questions just about time for afternoon class, I guess. Yep. Well, look, I'll, I'll, I'll wrap it up. Um, thank you for joining us, Hagley, um, and other schools who are going to be watching this uh, at a later uh, time. Uh, we'll get this up on the web as soon as we can, on our website as soon as we can. Again, if you've got any other questions you want to know, uh, want the answers to, do email us via the um, website, the inquiry at the Amazing Place website. Uh, it's really important they're coming through that way and we'll put them on to these two guys who will who will answer the questions for you um, And I hope your day is going well And I hope your competition is going well. So thank you Jan. Thank you Guy. It's great to see you guys here too and have fun and go be amazing Thank you Thanks guys